Good morning. Welcome to worship. It's good to see you this morning as we gather to celebrate the love, the salvation, the joy of life in Jesus. I'm so excited about the service today. We have uh, wonderful hymns, beautiful music, and I can't wait to get to the message to share with you about meaningful life. Um, who would you like for us to be remembering in prayer today? I would like to mention to you that we'd love for you to pray for Timothy Hess and his family. Timothy's son died on Thursday. Uh, Timothy attends uh, the 11 o'clock service. I don't know whether you know Timothy and his fiance, Gail. Uh, they've been coming here since December. The memorial service will be on Friday at 6 in the chapel, so please pray for them. Also, I know you want to know how Noel's doing. Uh, Noel Bright continues to make slow but steady progress. This week, they took her off the ventilator. She's been able to sit supported in a wheelchair for about an hour, and also, she began to speak uh, on Thursday, so that's really wonderful. Uh, one or two words at the time, but just steady progress. Your prayers are, are wonderfully powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Who else would you like for us to remember in prayer today? On this side, is there anyone? Yes? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on this side? How about on this side? Yes? Come on. Come on. Sorry. Go ahead. Connie Keller. Connie Keller. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Malambi, my cousin. Thank you. <clears throat> Jeanette Lenza. Jeanette Lenza. Thank you. Anyone from the choir? Carol Welch. Carol Welch. I'd like, it's my mother, it would have been my mother's birthday today. So I'd like to pray for all mothers in heaven. Wonderful, wonderful, yes. Ramon Sanchez. Thank you. Ron and Vicki, Jazz and Keith and Jacob. Thank you, thank you. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so glad to be in your house. We're glad for the path of life. We're glad that you with your scriptures and also with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit guide us on the path of life. You hear us as we pray. You're invested so much in us and in our well-being and in our connection with eternal life. And you delight to hear our prayers that the Bible says, rise up before you like sweet-smelling incense. And so we delight to delight you in our prayers. We pray for ourselves. We pray for our families. We pray for our friends. We pray for all those whose names have been called on our lips and in our hearts, we ask that you surround and bless those who are in need, not only with the power and grace of your Holy Spirit, but that you would use us to minister to them. And now, Lord, we ask that as you fill this sanctuary and our hearts with your Holy Spirit, that your praise would rise up within us. In Jesus' name, amen. The opening hymn is number 158, Come Christians Join to Sing. <laughs>
Be seated. <coughs> Next Sunday, when you get here, it's going to look rather different in here because this place is going to be sort of transformed into a cave-like area because Vacation Bible School is this week. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Children and parents everywhere look forward to Vacation Bible School Week. If you are helping with Bible School, thank you a thousand times. If you would like, if you have a morning that you can offer a few minutes, just contact <coughs> Renee White. Uh, maybe give her a call today. Her number is 202-3209. That's 202-3209. And uh, she will return your call. Renee, stand up so we can see you. Woohoo! Uh, thank you for giving leadership to VBS this year, Renee. And now let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Please continue in silent confession. O Lord, we beseech thee, absolve thy people from their offenses, that through thy bountiful goodness we may be delivered from the bonds of those sins which by our frailty we have committed. Grant this, O Heavenly Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come now to the mission moment, which um, you may not think of as a mission, but it absolutely is. And that mission is the recording of our services Sunday by Sunday and then posting them online so that everybody can see them. It's a really cool mission for a couple of reasons. One is sometimes uh, you are away from here because perhaps you're sick, you've had surgery, and you don't want to miss a Sunday and all you have to do is just go to duckchurch.org, and that brings up the church webpage, and then you just click on um, worship services, and you go to the worship service that was this past Sunday, and you can just sit there and watch the whole thing. Or if you don't watch the whole thing, won't want to, you can just sort of scroll to the part that you were interested in. So that's a wonderful ministry for us when we're sick. 
It's also a really cool ministry for people who are here on vacation, and they say, wow, I really love the services at Duck. I wish I could be there every Sunday, uh, but I, I live in Wisconsin. Well, the truth is, uh, even in Wisconsin or in Florida, you can still uh, see what those services are. And you would be amazed at the thousands of people who go to our website just for that purpose. So we're grateful for the people that make that ministry possible and I invite you to see this. Several years ago, we revamped the video system in order to allow folks who were not able to show up at church on any given Sunday the ability to feel as though they were still there in worship with us. Each week, the tech team works tirelessly behind the scenes in order to make this outreach possible. Maybe you can't get to church because you've been injured. Maybe you're out of town that week. Maybe you're just a visitor and you want to see what our worship experience is like. Maybe you heard a message on Sunday morning that you want to share with a friend. You can do that through these videos. Our videos have the ability to go all over the U.S. and even all over the world. To access our worship videos, go to www.duckchurch.org. Click on the worship videos and see everything we have to offer. We want to thank those who make this possible. And now, if the ushers will come forward, we'll receive the morning tithes and offerings.
Heavenly Father, the day will come when all of us, each of us, will be in that heavenly realm to enjoy being in fellowship with you forever. And when that day comes for each of us, the opportunity for doing good here will be passed. Thank you for giving us vision and a heart to serve you and those around us in blessing here and now. Bless these gifts as we offer them to you. Multiply them for your ministry of eternal life to those here on the beach, throughout the nation, the state, and the world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please remain standing for the hymn, which is found in your slim black volume, Eternal Father, Strong to Save. I invite you to share with one another signs of grace and peace.
You are so good at passing the peace. <laughs> this is a friendly church, and that is a big deal. Praise God. Let's stand as we affirm what we believe. <laughs> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The scripture comes from 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, and we see here that the prophecy against uh, Eli and his sons is fulfilled. Uh, many years earlier, God had sent a word to the boy prophet Samuel about what would happen to Eli and to his family, giving them really many years to change their path, many years to repent. Did they repent? No. Did they change their path? No. And so the prophecy is fulfilled. 1 Samuel chapter 4, 1 through 11. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. What this tells us is that by this time, Samuel has become a young adult. So in the last part of the scripture, Samuel's a boy. In the uh, length of time that transpired, Samuel's become a young adult. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. In those days, the Philistines mustered for war against Israel. And Israel went out to battle against them, and they encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel, and when the battle was joined, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. When the troops came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord put us to rout today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, so that he may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. When the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, What does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? 
When they learned that the ark of the Lord had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid, for they said, Gods have come into the camp. They also said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, in order not to become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought. Israel was defeated and they fled, everyone to his home. It was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Yesterday, I was driving home from Durham, uh, and uh, I looked down at my gas needle, and it was getting pretty close to empty. I wasn't really sure where the next gas station would be and uh, didn't want to take a risk, so I said, well, I'll just take the next gas station sign that I see. Now, I don't know about you, but on long trips, I like to play uh, books on CD. Does anybody else like to do that? Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? Listen to a story, maybe learn something. Uh, increase my literary uh, information because it's woefully thin, as watching Jeopardy proves on a regular <laughs> basis. So anyway, I'm listening to Ken Follett's book of Pillars of the Earth. It's, uh, gosh, it's, it's such a fascinating book, and I'm really, I'm really enjoying it. it it's at uh, uh, sort of a climactic scene. I see a sign for gasoline. I pull off at the exit, and then it turns out, as Murphy's Law would always have it, that there's not really a gas station there at all. It's just, a, you know, it's just a decoy. And so I'm going to have to drive a few miles to get to this gas station, but by the time I figure that out, I'm invested in it. It's a few turns later. It doesn't look too complicated, and I'm really enjoying my story. Uh, so anyway, I get to the gas station. It's not the kind of gas that I like, uh, but it's gas. So I stop. I fill up the tank all the way to the top. Gas must be a little more expensive now because it costs me more than usual to fill up. I hop in the car, my story comes back on, and I'm just sort of going down the road, and uh, everything is good. It's a beautiful, sunny day. I'm enjoying my drive. I'm enjoying my story, and I'm just going along, and all of a sudden I go... This road does not look familiar. <laughs> look, there's a sign for Bailey, North Carolina. I don't think that's where I'm supposed to be. And so I go a little farther, you know, and I'm just sort of looking around going, no, no, this is not right. So then I have to think to myself, well, I know I came out of the gas station in the right direction, what is not working here? So I, I turn around and I, I go back and I think, well, I'll see the turn off. So I turn around and I go back. Nope, I don't see the turn off. You know what I'm finally reduced to doing? You guessed it. I'm finally reduced to clicking into my phone, current location, and Duck, North Carolina. Thankfully, it gives me directions on how to get back to 64. And of course, this is what happens to poor Pastor John when he's driving along, listening to stories on CD instead of paying attention to how to get back on 64. I don't know if you're one of those people that tends to get lost or not. I I'm convinced that there are two kinds of people in the world. You know, I say this from time to time with different applications, but there are the people that have a sense of direction and there are the people that don't. I don't know which one you are, but, you know, God is so good. He, he tends to pair up people who don't have a sense of direction with those who do. So when Elizabeth is in the car with me, everything is just fine. <laughs> 
<laughs> Otherwise, I have to rely on, I don't know, the Garmin. Well, if you're one of those people who has a tendency to get lost, then you know what it's like. You don't intend to get lost. You don't start out your trip going, wow, it's a gorgeous day. I think I'll get lost today. I mean, that's not the way you do it at all. You, you leave the house, or in my case, the gas station, and you know exactly where you think you're headed, right? <laughs> You know exactly where you think that you're going. And so you get in the car, and you, you know where you mean to be going, but I got news for you. Uh, it doesn't matter how sincere I was about getting to Duck, North Carolina yesterday afternoon. Sincerity was not the problem. Intention was not the problem. The problem was I was on the wrong road. And it doesn't matter how sincerely you are on the wrong road. If you are on the wrong road, you're not going to where you want to go. You're going to where the road takes you. Can I get an amen on that? You know, life is that way. Life is that way. I'm not saying sincerity doesn't matter. It does. Sincerity is important. Intention is important. But I'm going to tell you something you also know. The road you are on determines where you wind up. The road in life that you are on determines where you end up. And it doesn't matter what you thought. It doesn't matter how sincere you were. The road that you are on determines where you will wind up. And you know, sometimes the choices we make, we think they're just an event. The choices that we make, we tend to think they're just an event. This is just a one-time thing. It's just an event. But you know what? The choices that you and I make are not just an event. Now, they are an event, but they're not just an event. They are a path. They are a path, aren't they? When somebody decides that they want to buy something that they can't quite afford and they charge it, that's not just an event. That's a path. And that path is called the path of debt. And it's going to take a while to get off that path. It's not just an event. It's a path. When somebody begins to notice that they're feeling like they're awfully good friends with someone they're not married to, and then they begin to daydream about that person a little bit. And then they begin to find themselves having lunch together, just the two of them, to talk about, oh, I don't know, innocent topics. I'm sorry. That's not just lunch, is it? That's not just an event, is it? That's a path. When we experience making a choice that's not just a one-off choice it's a path and what we have to do is we have to look at the path that we're on in our financial life in our romantic relationships in our marriage we have to look at the path that we're on and say where is this headed? If I keep on with this trajectory, where am I headed? Those of you that have taken geometry lately, you see I'm reminded of geometry because I keep having teenagers that take it, right? But those of you who have taken geometry lately or you can remember back the decades to when you did, you remember how this works, don't you? 
you find a point on a graph, just one point, and that's just a point. But you find one more point on that graph, and that's not just a point anymore, it's a line. And you can take a ruler and draw that line from this point to that point, from point A to point B, and you can see the trajectory, can't you? Just two points make a line with a trajectory. Where's it going? Where's it going? Where's it going? In our relationship with God, one of the wonderful things is sometimes we're a little bit lost. We're just going along our, our merry way, listening to the background of the story that's so interesting, right? We're just going along our merry way. Everything is fine. And then we kind of get this strange feeling and we say, ooh, I'm not sure what territory I'm in. Um, I didn't realize I was so far in debt. Good gracious, look at the MasterCard bill this month. Wait a minute, I thought I paid that off. Or you get uh, your statement of giving from the church, and you say to your wife, didn't we give more than that this, this, so far this year? Yeah, there's a trajectory. Or you look at your calendar, and you see what's filling your calendar, and you say, wow, I thought I had been to church more often lately. What's been taking my time? You know, one of the wonderful things about being a Christian is that we have the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And if we will quiet our souls before him, he will speak to us. Now, he speaks to us in different ways, doesn't he? I know some people that think that God never speaks to them at all. I know some wonderful Christians who think that God never speaks to them. In fact, they will say to me, Pastor John, God never speaks to me. But you know what? I've been knowing these people long enough that I know that God does speak to them. They just don't realize it's the voice of God. Some people God speaks to by giving them an idea that is good and right and full of love, it's full of wisdom, and this idea, this plan, this mental picture is a gift from God. It's the way God speaks to some people. The way God speaks to some other people is by giving them a clear vision. They can see it in their mind's eye. They can see it with absolute crystalline clarity. God doesn't speak to everybody that way. He speaks to some people that way. God speaks to other people through what the Bible calls a gift of prophecy, where God gives words to somebody to share with others. We call that a gift of prophecy. God gave Samuel a gift of prophecy. And the gift of prophecy that God gave to Samuel was for the priest Eli and his two sons. And the word was, the trajectory that you are on is not an upward trajectory. It's a downward trajectory. God was good enough to give Eli and his sons years of warning about where they were headed. It wasn't that they didn't know. They did know what was going on. They knew the teaching of God in the scriptures. They knew what was right and what was wrong. They knew what they were doing. They just thought it didn't matter. They just thought it wouldn't catch up with them. They just thought it was an event, not a trajectory downward. They knew. And then because it was really important, God sent to them another message to say to them, 
You have to turn around. Did they turn around? No. They just kept right on going. And the prophecy was fulfilled. You know, it says in Galatians, in the New Testament, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. What a person sows, they will also reap. Don't be deceived. God isn't mocked. What a person sows, they will also reap. If we sow anger, what are we going to get back? If we sow hatred, what are we going to get back? If we sow gentleness, what are we going to get back? You know, the book of Proverbs tells us, a soft word turns away wrath. Sometimes somebody speaks to you in an angry way, and maybe they didn't mean to, or maybe they did mean to, but they were not in their best state. And they say something to you that's angry, the Bible tells us if you give them a soft response, it may turn away wrath. The Bible tells us that what we sow, we're going to also reap. You know, this is something that happens to every man and every woman, isn't it? It's something that happens to us, and it's something that happens to our children. You know, it's not right, is it, for us to sow one kind of seed and then be angry with God when those seed bring about a harvest of pain and death. And then we blame God. That's not wise or just. For every man and every woman... For our children, as they grow older, the choices that they make are not just an event, they're a trajectory. God gives us wisdom to see what that trajectory is so that we can choose life instead of choosing death. You know what Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke when his disciples don't agree with his trajectory. In Luke chapter 9, beginning with verse 22, he says, The Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day raised. What trajectory is Jesus on here? Well, he's on a trajectory of heaven. He's on a trajectory of redemption. He's on a trajectory of bringing redemption to you and to me and the whole world. That is his trajectory. It's not an easy one. It's a difficult one. But where he's headed is to eternal life for you and for me. That is his trajectory. And then he says, if any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. What's the trajectory that Jesus is talking about here? If you are giving your life to Jesus on a daily basis, if on a daily basis you're saying to the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do today? What do you want me to be doing with my life in general? And what do you want me to do today? Get up in the morning and say to the Lord, Lord, this is the day that you've made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. This is your day. What do you want me to do with it, Lord? It may be that you already know nine-tenths of what you're going to do because you've got to get up and go to work, because you've got a routine that you're already committed to. But you say to the Lord, what do you want me to do today? 
My life belongs to you. When we deny ourselves and we follow the will of God, it's a trajectory of life. It is an upward spiral of life and peace and joy. But when we hear the word of God, when we know his teaching and we think we are exempt, you like that? We know God's teaching, but we think we are the exception to the divine rule. We know God's teaching, but we think it doesn't apply to us. That's a trajectory, not of life, but of death. Not of peace, but of turmoil. When we offer our lives to God and we say, Lord, I want to be a follower of Jesus, what would you have me to do? What would you have me to do in my marriage? What would you have me to do in my love life? What would you have me to do in my family life? What would you have me to do in my financial life? What would you have me to do in my business life? Lord, let me be on your trajectory. When we say that to him, all of a sudden, we're not lost anymore. It's like realizing you're lost and punching into your Garmin. Current location. And now I need to get to Duck, North Carolina, and the directions come up. When you say to the Lord, Lord, I'm lost, where do I go from here? I want to tell you something. He doesn't look at you and say stuff like, you are so stupid. You are lost again. Instead, he looks at you and goes, yeah, lucky for you, I know the way out of this mess. And he will set your feet on a path of life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, there's something within us that has a propensity to get lost. Thank you that within you is a propensity for giving us the gift of life. Within you, there's a desire to put our feet on a path of life and health and joy and peace. Lord, as our heads are bowed, if there's anything that we're doing that is bringing us to danger, if there's anything that we're doing that's bringing us to sadness, to grief, we offer it to you. And we ask you to set our feet on a path of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, because he is our strong tower. If you'd like to come and to the altar and pray for any reason while we sing number 110. The altar is open to you. Let us stand.
receive this benediction. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the throne of grace with exceeding joy, unto the only wise God be honor, glory, dominion, and power. And may the love of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>